The 6 o'clock news starts right now. We're not a bank and they weren't intended for us in the health system to use. They were really for this community. University Health donating $350,000 today to a pair of Uvalde community organizations, or rather they passed on those donations. After the Rob Elementary shooting, University Health, which treated some of those victims, received more than half a million dollars in unsolicited donations. Although the health system used some of that money to help the families, it found itself with a lot left over. Garrett Berenger tells us how those funds will be used. It's been just over 16 months since the tragedy at Rob Elementary which is still not far from the minds of the Uvalde community. But as a pair of donations this morning showed, people outside this small Texas town haven't forgotten either. At a luncheon in the center of Uvalde, University Health CEO passed over a check and the goodwill associated with it. 1,851 people donated money to our foundation and they donated it because they wanted to help as a result of the tragedy. The $100,000 check to the Evalde After School All Stars program was the second check the health system had passed out this morning. The first for a quarter million went to family service. Both checks coming out of donations University Health received that says we're always meant for the Uvalde community. So uh, we started doing some research and figuring out what, what does Uvalde really need. Family service offers various assistance, including mental health counseling, and has found its services in high demand as more family members and people affected by the tragedy seek them out. For them, the money means ensuring they'll be there to help. We will have families that will need long-term support and, and help, and we want to ensure that we are here to do that. The After School All-Stars program also has plans for the extra money. It allows us to get the, the people we need to bring into our program after school, and it allows us maybe to take trips into San Antonio and, and go to museums. To Uvalde's mayor, the money is another tie to a city an hour and a half away, but that feels much closer. I look at San Antonio now as our big brother. The love and outpouring of, of help that we have seen from San Antonio, from your community, from your elected officials and that, I mean, it's just been, it's just been truly a blessing. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. The Bear County DA says his office intends to prosecute the cases against two former San Antonio police officers accused of beating a man and kicking in his door. Today, Judge Ron Ronquel granted a mistrial for Carlos Castro and Thomas Villarreal. They're charged with aggravated assault. Their attorney says he made the decision to ask for a mistrial after a hearing outside of the jury's presence yesterday. That's when he says he learned state witnesses believed it was reasonable for his clients to act like they did. We would have completely tried the case differently had we known that the state's own witnesses from the police academy believed that the use of force in this case was reasonable um, and had an opinion that it was reasonable. Bear County DA Joe Gonzalez says his office intends to proceed with prosecuting these cases. The officers are indefinitely suspended. SAPD says no date has been set for their arbitration. A man charged in a brutal attack at a barber shop more than three years ago was in court today. Damian Campbell is charged with murder and two counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Erica Hernandez looks at where that case stands now and when it could go to trial. It's been more than three years since Haley J. O'Regan was fatally stabbed at the Diesel Barber Shop on Bandera Road on May 6, 2020. O'Regan and two others were allegedly attacked by Damian Campbell. According to the arrest affidavit, Campbell went into the barber shop after it was closed and told the employees he wanted to set up a future appointment. As they tried to help him, he allegedly attacked them. Campbell was last seen in the 186 District Court back in February, but a competency hearing was requested. Eight months later, he has been ruled competent to stand trial. Was there a discussion on whether either side is ready for trial at this point? Both the state and defense telling Judge Christina Escalona they had an out-of-state witness and would need some time to arrange their travel. But with the holidays fast approaching, scheduling a date a few months from now would be too difficult. Because of the age of the case and how long Mr. Campbell has been in uh, Bear County Jail, this will be a priority case. Campbell's defense attorney says he filed a notice of insanity defense, which means he will present evidence to show Campbell had a mental health problem at the time of the murder. The case will be called back in the next 30 days. And then after that, if and when it does go to trial, it could probably be early next year. At the Kidney Reeves Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News.
Police in Pleasanton made an arrest in a hit and run that killed a 17 year old girl overnight. According to Pleasanton police, 46 year old Jose Torres Garcia allegedly hit and killed that girl. She was walking on Humble Camp Road near South Main Street when it happened sometime after midnight. Authorities say they identified Torres Garcia after he returned to the scene. He's now charged with failure to stop and render aid, resulting in death. The name of the teenager girl, teenager killed rather, has not been released. And tonight, the Biden administration is continuing to face questions after announcing they will clear the way for more border wall construction. But the administration is defending its plan amid the uptick in border crossings from Mexico into the U.S. During the Trump presidency, Congress designated hundreds of millions of dollars for border wall construction. So the question many are having, why is this happening now if those funds have been available since President Biden took office? He's been asking Congress to reappropriate the funds. He has been. Uh, for the past couple of years, and Congress refused. We had no choice. It was mandated. Customs and Border Protection plans to indicate that the new construction will be an 18-foot portable barrier different than the 30-foot baller design added under the Trump administration. Tonight, we now know what's on the agenda for the state legislature's third special session. At the top of Governor Greg Abbott's list is, as expected, school choice. This would set up a program to allocate public taxpayer money for private education. Also on the agenda, border security legislation. That includes increasing criminal penalties for illegal entry across the U.S.-Mexico border. That special session starts on Monday. And the VA sounding the alarm for veterans to be vigilant against PACT Act scams. This comes in the wake of President Biden signing the PACT Act into effect back in August. It's a law that extends health care to veterans that were exposed to toxic substances. Our Jonathan Cotto brings us what to be on the lookout for and how to protect your personal information front and center. While the PACT Act brings much needed health care support to our veterans who have been exposed to hazardous conditions, it has also attracted the attention of scammers looking to exploit this situation. The PACT Act signed into law by President Joe Biden is a crucial step in providing health care assistance to veterans dealing with the aftermath of toxic exposure during their service. Now the VA says scammers have seen an opportunity in this and are preying on veterans with fraudulent schemes. The VA says PACT Act related scams are on the rise and are targeting veterans to access their PACT Act benefits or submit claims on their behalf through things like phishing, that's by email, phishing, that's by phone, and social media scams. While some attempts may appear legitimate, veterans should remain cautious and verify the validity of any communication or request they receive. The VA says there are ways to protect yourself and recognize some red flags. For starters, don't provide personal, benefits, medical, or financial details. Check for the HTTPS at the start of website addresses, online or over the phone. And more importantly, federal agencies will not contact you unless you make a request. The VA also recommends enabling multi-factor authentication on all accounts. Don't click on online ads or engage with social media that seems suspicious. And work with veteran service providers you're already familiar with. For veterans looking to apply for benefits, www.va.gov forward slash PACT is the official source of PACT Act information. Reporting front and center, Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. Look outside with live cam this evening. Take a look at that in the corner there. Low 80s right now. You love to see it. Oh, you love to see it. And Justin Horn is with us this evening. Okay, this feels like fall is finally here. Finally, finally. <laughs> uh, it felt great today. It really did. We're going to get some better weather coming up this weekend, too. So it's all good. All good news in the forecast. Here's a look at the time lapse. Clouds have increased a little bit. So we've got mostly cloudy skies at this hour. We did make it up to 86 today, so it was warm but so much better than what we've been seeing. The low this morning, 69. The averages are 85 and 64, so we are pretty close to average today. As we look at the satellite picture, a lot of clouds cover streaming through, so we'll see that most of the night. Uh, temperatures at this hour, 83 here in San Antonio. Most places in the 70s and 80s. And as uh, we look at the uh, temperatures across the country, we've got some cooler air just to our north. That front that you see here drops south tonight. It will be here by tomorrow morning, bringing another shot of cooler drier air for the weekend and that's why we're so excited about temperatures potentially in the 50s by Sunday morning. We're going to talk more about that in your seven day forecast too here in just a few minutes.
All right, we'll see you then. Thanks, Justin. Let's take a look at a slowdown during the 6 o'clock Friday commute. This is the camera I-10 at Hackberry here. Look off in the distance there. You can see the flashing lights. You can see the reason for the slowdown. Looks like this could be an accident that's in the clearing stages. Looks as if that hero vehicle is pulling away, as well as the vehicles involved in that accident. But definitely a lot of taillights and a backup because of it. Hopefully that is soon to end at I-10 and Hackberry. And looking ahead on KSAT 12, starting Monday, Good Morning San Antonio will air from 5 to 7 a.m. on weekday mornings. We'll continue to share stories that matter to you and your family at a time that works for you. So be sure to tune in bright and early for all your breaking overnight news, traffic, and weather authority forecasts on GMSA weekdays from 5 to 7 a.m. You can watch it live on KSAT 12 or wherever you stream your news. You can cook it anyway and make it anyway. Coming up in our next half hour, a history lesson in lingua. Jesse DeGoyado takes us into the kitchen for a one-on-one -on -one home cooking lesson to learn all about lingua and its contribution to Mexican cuisine. That's tonight at 6.30. Some people, that might be an awful thing to taste, but just remember awful is just a name for organs out of any count. Looking forward to that one. And after the break, define statistics, how St. Mary's University is hoping to get more Hispanic women involved in law school. Next. Organization for help, why even more people will get the help they need tonight. Going to law school or becoming an attorney remains a challenge for Latinas, making up only a small percentage of attorneys. St. Mary's Law School wants to combat that statistic with the Latina Networking Summit. Get it? Latina? Latina. Latina. Yeah, there you go. Camila Juarez tells us how these women are helping each other in every stage of their legal career. Less than 2% of the legal field is made up of Latinas, um, and we really want to bring together Latinas from every stage because you really do need that support. Law student Annalisa Casanova-Smith is the first in her family to pursue a law degree. She helped organize this year's Latina Networking Summit. Attorneys are giving advice about how to pay for law school, LSAT application support, law school guidance, even how to negotiate pay. This is just such an important event for individuals like myself who don't know the answers to those questions, who don't have a, a relative or or family member who can embark on, you know, part on them, their own knowledge. First generation attorney Christina Zamorano says the Latina Summit at St. Mary's Law School is creating a network of support. Pre-law student Hannah Lopez, also first gen, is taking that advice seriously. And they're telling us that we have to have a sisterhood, that there is a boys club that we have to compete with and we need to create a, like a sisterhood that is going to help us in the future. This is the second year for the Latina Summit, and the number of women attending this year has doubled. Also new this year, they had a moot court, and they're giving away scholarships. And when you feel acknowledged and you feel seen, you really feel like you can do anything. Camila Juarez, KSAT 12 News. Let's turn to the forecast now. This is the weekend. This is the time we have waited so patiently for. And we've been talking about it. The forecast for the weekend is the best part. Yeah, it really is. I mean, it is. We're excited about it. I know we're excited in the weather department. And most of the newsroom is excited, but I think the folks out covering Friday Night Football are most excited about this right? forecast because hey, it feels great out there this evening. We've got lower dew points and it only gets better. Let me take you outside. First off, we've got mostly cloudy skies. We've got a lot of high cloudiness coming through and uh, at the moment, uh, yes, it is mostly cloudy here in San Antonio, 83 degrees. 86 in New Braunfels, 83 in Seguin, 79 in Bernie, and 80 right now in Kerrville. And uh, temperatures are on their way down. So the forecast this evening, if you plan to be out and about, maybe you're going to some Friday night football games, looks pretty good. 77 at 8 o'clock, 75, 9 p.m. By 10 p.m., we're down to 77. 72 at midnight, 70 at 1 a.m., and then we're down into the 60s. And so by tomorrow morning, we're thinking lows in the low 60s, breezy and cool. So not only will it be cool, you'll get that good northeasterly wind, 10 to 20 miles per hour. It'll be gusty from time to time, especially first half of the day. So heads up there, we could see some gusts close to 30 miles per hour. And as we look at the temperatures across the country, it's a pretty interesting temperature map in the sense that it's 103 right now in Phoenix. Incredible heat there across the desert southwest. If you've got some cooler air working in from the north, pushing into Texas, 
and that will work its way down to San Antonio by tomorrow morning. So this kind of secondary front, the second push of cooler, drier air gets here by sunrise tomorrow. And that's why we think temperatures will be a little cooler than they were today over the weekend. You can see the difference here. 60 in Amarillo right now, 78 in Lubbock. So you can see the difference this front is making. 85 in Dallas, 81 in Waco. And as we look at the dew points here, that dry air gets pushed south. So by tomorrow morning, dew points are falling into the 40s. And then by the afternoon, we could see dew points as low as the 30s here around South Texas, which is almost desert air. I mean, it's going to feel a lot different both Saturday and Sunday. With that front, you get the gusty winds as we set out of the northeast. Gusts as high as 30 miles per hour possible tomorrow morning. So if you have a soccer match tomorrow morning or whatever plans you have, know that it will be breezy. Again, first half of the day and then those winds subside by the afternoon. So tomorrow, 76 is our high. 79 Sunday, and I'll point out Sunday morning, 56. 56 degrees. It's been so long since we've seen numbers like that. It'll feel really good Sunday morning as temperatures fall. Uh, area wide. Now we do have what looks like some rain here across parts of Mexico. It's not really reaching the ground. The air is just too dry at the surface. This is upper level moisture that we've got streaming in from the Pacific and I don't anticipate any rain this weekend, but you may see, see some returns like that on the radar and it's all way up in the atmosphere and we have those high clouds that will continue to stream through. They just they won't produce any rain that reaches the ground and this is part of some tropical moisture that's out in the Pacific. Uh, that is uh, tropical storm Lydia that is feeding in some of that high cloudiness for us. And that will keep us, again, fairly cloudy tomorrow before the clouds kind of break up on Sunday. Down the line, this uh, first system moves away. And here comes our next one, moves into the middle part of the country by Wednesday into Thursday. And that should push a front through, I think, by late Thursday into early Friday. This is going to be our next chance of rain, and it will cool us down some, too. Uh, it looks like by Friday. I don't think rain chances are great with this, but they are there, 20 to 30 percent Thursday afternoon. And then you see numbers uh, dropping again on Friday down to 80. We build, by the way, until we get to that front. So upper 80 is close to 90 Wednesday and Thursday. It will be warm, but at least we get another front, cools us down again. And the good news here, too, it looks like we may clear out just in time for the eclipse Ooh. Uh, coming up next Saturday, which this is all working out fantastically. Yeah, we've been wondering about the timing of that. We're going to enjoy these temperatures in the meantime. Thank yes. you, Justin. Things are falling into place. Good stuff. <laughs> also, this weekend forecast is great for a big-time college football matchup. Yeah. We have a lot of people here at Case that are excited. Yeah. The Red River rivalry, Texas OU, both undefeated. Yeah, and it's the last time they're going to play this contest as members of the Big 12. So, you know, one of these teams wants to win this final one as a member of the Big 12 conference. We are live up at the Cotton Bowl. Mary Rominger will have more. Plus, BGC tonight, one of our big games. Hondo at Jordanton, district opener, 14-3-8-D1. Both of these teams undefeated. Coming up. One of our big games tonight will feature the Hondo Owls at the Jerton Indians at District 14-3, one opener for both teams. Both are 5-0 and and playing some very good football, and both are well-rested coming off of a bye week. Now, you could use the word pressure to describe this game tonight, and you wouldn't be wrong. KSATO Sports' Nick Mantis has more from Jerton. Pressure. That's what you get when you have a lot of success. And for these Jordanson Indians, having won three out of their last four district titles and coming into their first district matchup against another undefeated team in Hondo, they told us that's the type of pressure that they really like. That's the pressure you invite. That's the pressure you want. Uh, when you get pressure, it's because you're winning. It's because you're doing things good. And, you know, like I said, this is my 19th year as a head coach. We've had some good years and bad. But when you've got pressure on you to win, that's, that's a good thing. I mean, just starting off, like, the district like this, I mean, it's amazing. People wish for this. We This is what we play for. This is what we practice for. So it's really exciting playing these big games because it gets us ready for playoffs and, and having that atmosphere around us. Somebody who hasn't seen you guys play yet, what should they know about this team? We got grit. We play hard. You're never going to see us slacking, ever. I look forward to seeing what these guys can do Friday, uh, again, against a very well-coached Hondo team. That uh, It's going it's to be a fun one. Okay, now I'm ready to go put some pads on and hit somebody. You probably are, too. Don't miss our BGC road trip coverage as Jordanson takes on Hondo tonight on the Night Beat. In Jordanson, Nick Mantis, KSAT 12 Sports. Thank you, Nick. Here's the road trip tonight. Lytle at Poteet and then Hondo at Jordanton. We'll have those highlights for you on the Night Beat. 
Tomorrow morning, the Oklahoma Sooners and Texas Longhorns will meet up for the 119th edition of the Red River Rivalry. Texas won the Golden Hat last season in a shutout 49 zip. That win snapped the four game winning streak by the Sooners. Now, this is the last time the two will meet in this game as members of the Big 12. After this season, they'll join the SEC. Texas is number three in the AP poll, Oklahoma number 12, and both are undefeated. This is a big game. Sports is there for more. Let's go live to the State Fair of Texas and Dallas where Mary Rominger is standing by. Hey, Larry. So as you know, I went to a Big 12 school, but I never experienced a rivalry like OU and Texas. So to get better prepared for what to expect tomorrow, Photog Billy Cadero and I walked around the fairgrounds to talk to fans to see exactly what to expect and what's going on in their minds. It's something like you've ever seen before, like yeah. it's, just, it's just like Texas and Oklahoma, like coming together, big rivalry. It's awesome. Like we both drive about the same amount of time yeah. from Austin, Texas yeah. and from Norman, Oklahoma to meet in the middle. This year's Red River rivalry game just feels different. Texas and Oklahoma are on their respective Big 12 farewell tours while being serious contenders to win the Big 12 Conference Championship. It's always nice to end on a high note, especially considering OU has been on top for as long as I can remember my entire life. I'm 25, so sure, last year was kind of a fluke game. You know, when you have a tight end playing quarterback, it's not always fun. But um, I think the Sooners are going to bounce back this year, and I think uh, we're going to end up on top as uh, undefeated Big 12 champions. <laughs> Meanwhile, both fan bases are living in the moment, appreciating being a part of one of the best rivalries in college football. You know, I don't even think about the SEC yet. I mean, this is a rivalry that's just been a, <laughs> it's just been a rivalry that's lasted forever. And so we're just excited for a fun day. People watching is the best and, and a Horns victory. Whether you're rooting for the Longhorns or Sooners, it'll be all right, all right, all right. Now that guy uh, is the owner of the beer barn right outside of the Cotton Bowl and he was a fraternity brother with Matthew McConaughey at UT. Fun fact. So our coverage continues all weekend long and we'll have a full recap of the game after uh, after the game on Saturday during the night beat. Uh, but that's it from us here at the Cotton Bowl. And Larry, if you can hear me, I'd love to hear your best. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. How's that? Uh, I actually, I've always loved the way you say, right. Right. I'll give you, you an A. Larry Twang. A little Larry Twang going <laughs> on there. I don't got a dog in that fight, but I'm excited to see both of them undefeated. For sure. Looking yes, forward to a yeah. good Absolutely. Matchup. Thanks for that, Larry. Thanks, Larry. A lesson in lingua when we come back.